The Feynman Lectures on the Character of Physical Law, Part 5. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. And I think this will be the final episode in the Character of Physical Law series. Uh, We just have the final chapter or lecture to go through, Seeking New Laws, lecture number seven, and then some of the stuff in the foreword, which was written in 2002 and purports to update some of the things that Feynman said in the 60s. We'll see Alrighty. about that. How's it going, everybody? I just got back from a coast trip with GMA oh, yeah. and uh, Tyrell. And, um, Is that, does that count as a rock and roll update? That's the rock and roll update. We brought all of our equipment, and we didn't jam. <laughs> we drank, of course not. We drank a mountain of beers, and I fished all day. Mm. Excellent. I saw you were... Uh, watering the underside of your car. I was, when I arrived. Yeah. Yes. With the sprinkler. Yeah, yeah. That's the old stash method. Yep. Yep. Slide the sprinkler underneath the car oh, after man. a trip to the beach and it washes all that salt water and salt and, and sand out of there. The stash really made me look good, dude. He hooked me up with the fishing equipment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was reeling him in. It was great. Oh, good. You caught, you caught, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Caught some shark and caught some, uh, did you guys cook them and eat them? Or? No, I filleted him and brought him home. Oh, okay. I had to bring the wife something. Oh, right. <laughs> Just bring her a couple of seashells. But, so GMA Archer, he had a surprise wedding. That's right. So he never That's had a, a bachelor wedding. party. Yeah. <laughs> so we all show up to a party that he's throwing, and then... Archer and Terry just walk out, and he's in a suit, and she's in a wedding dress. Yeah. And they're like, whoa! whoa. <laughs> they just get married right there in front of the whole party. It was great. Yeah. I think we talked about that. But so, yeah, so the bachelor party was after the wedding. Right. It was cool. Yep. I I got the LASIK. Yep. So that's and done. You didn't get to go to the beach where it was all sandy. Right. That's right. I couldn't go to the beach. I'm still dealing with the aftermath, but the... Um, it was an interesting procedure. It is fast. I can tell you that. Fast. <laughs> it's 15 minutes at max and you're done. Wow. That's um, crazy. Yeah. And you're awake for the whole thing. They have to talk you through it because you have to do things like look at stuff, you know, look at this, look at the little green light, you know. Um, but yeah, basically they lay you down on your back. Man. There's all of this... Uh, equipment hovering over you in a bunch of bright lights and then the doctor and then they i mean you know they're it's craziness um but cool too it's like it's one of those experiences where you're like this is this is amazing yeah yeah you know this laser is burning my eyeball yes yeah they actually so can so, they... so i can describe it because i mean you know i saw it first person <laughs> <laughs> i didn't get to see it what it really looks like but I was from the inside, but they basically, they put this thing over, they cover one eye and they put this other thing over the other eye and it actually presses really hard into your, into the eye orbit. It, that hurt. Like it actually, oh. it mashes in there and it's hitting that bone around your eye oh. really hard and it, and like it locks in and it's just jamming your skull against the, the headrest Whoa. that you're on. And then that thing actually goes all the way around your cornea. You can't feel it because at this point they've given you a local Mm -hmm. anesthetic on your eye, a bunch of drops that just completely numbs it. But it cuts all the way around your cornea except for one little piece up at the top. And then they pull that thing off and then another little thing comes and lifts that flap. Oh, no. (laughs) Up off your cornea. And then they bring the laser in and it shapes that thing while it's picked up. From the From the side. It shapes it from over here and you can smell it. It smells like burning hair. Oh, dude. As it's cutting that, and then the doctor like does all this stuff with little tiny paint brushes on your eye, uh. little bitty sponges, and then he lay lay it back down, and then he coats it with some material, and then they cover that eye, and they do it with the other one. <laughs> it's so fast. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, when they bring the laser in from the side and it cuts that flap, you can smell it. Oh, it smells like God. they've set your hair on fire. <laughs> 
You don't feel anything except that thing I pushing I feel you. it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they cut it off. <laughs> Yeah, they call it the flap. This is why oh, you have to be God. so careful afterwards because, and this is the other thing that's amazing. After you're done, that flap is just like laying there, yeah. but they're expecting your cornea to heal. And the, one of the amazing things about the cornea, and I talked, to, I talked extensively to Snake Mom about this because she is an ophthalmologist. She knows all this yeah. stuff, is that the cornea is one of the few parts of the body that can fully heal itself with no scar tissue. It's just, wow. you know. So they're able to cut that flap off there and have only the tiniest piece of it still leaving it connected. And then they lay it back down on the eye like a lens and they put some they put something on there, some drops or whatever. And then you're supposed to keep it. You're very careful and whatever. And it just heals completely and doesn't leave any sign that it was cut off. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. But yeah, they don't they don't actually shape it with the laser by pointing it at your eye. That would be dangerous. So they lift yeah, that thing up. Yeah, because they might, they might like mess yeah, up the rods and cutting cones or lasers. Something. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I imagine that these lasers were just cutting the outside of the lens, but they're actually shaping it from the well, inside. Well, yeah. The problem with lenses is that they're clear, so it can go through if it was pointed at it. But they, so they lift <laughs> this thing up where it's basically out of your eye orbit, uh, and then shape uh, it from the side. <laughs> Kyle can't handle it. I'm sorry uh, if anybody is uh, a. <laughs> I didn't mean to it's in, like induce that much hurting my cringe. eye thinking about this right now. <laughs> but yes, like about 45 minutes after the procedure was done, it felt like I had sand in my eyes for the next six hours. It was uh, mm. highly uncomfortable. I couldn't open them. I, you know, basically, and they give you goggles you have to wear for the entire day. Uh, I have to sleep in the goggles for the next week because you don't, they don't want you like accidentally rubbing your eye in your sleep and disturbing Ooh. the flap. So I have a real problem with like, <laughs> I guess it's like, it, it, it's some kind squirming. of like, I, yeah, yeah. it's like, I can feel it or something. Yeah. It's like this weird, what do you call that? It's like some kind of em empathy or something. Yeah, an empathetic reaction. <sighs> yep. So yeah, it was, cool, it was, man. it was quite, in it was quite interesting. And I mean, I sat up out of the, you know, I sat up off the operating table already able to see better than I have in my entire life. Everything was foggy. Right. It was foggy, but I can already tell just sitting up off the operating table while the, the this was while the um, my eyes were still numb so I could keep them open. But I, I was like, oh, my God, you know, I could see everything was sort of like better than even with glasses. Oh, and... yeah, well, no, no, no. It was foggy. Right. But it looked like I, it was like I was wearing glasses, but they had been, you know, that they were dirty or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Uh, but then eventually, like, the, the anesthetic wears off and my eyes, I closed them and then I just couldn't open them without, I mean, there were tears pouring out and everything. But, yeah, you know. She sent me a picture of you. <laughs> yeah. I find it's like. I'm wearing the goggles. My eyes are all puffy. Yeah. Yeah, I could barely, I could barely open them. But by, the, by that night, I could open them and, and you know, they, they stung a little. They felt like I had an eyelash in them or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but by the next day. The discomfort was almost completely gone. There, were, everything was still a little fuzzy. Uh, by the day after that, it was the the discomfort was completely gone. I don't have any discomfort now, but I'm still being really careful with them. I have to use. I've got medicated drops that I have to uh, a whole set of them. Is the fogginess completely gone? Yeah, yeah. Shit. The fogginess was gone yesterday. Dude, that's awesome. And it's man. better vision than I've ever had. You know, and I got the mono, so it's like they. They figured out which one, which eye was dominant, which basically means that's the one you use when you're looking at stuff far distant away. Distant things. Yeah. Pyramids. That's right. So they made the dominant eye the distance vision, and then they made my left eye the one for close vision. So I can... Pot shirts. Yes. <laughs> so I can both look at pyramids and pot shirts without having any problems. Yes. Yeah. 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 We had the discussion about this. It was like, I was like, dude, <laughs> you have to be able to see pyramids. <laughs> yeah. like, you need to go get this done. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting procedure. And it was That's very really fast. Cool. And yeah, the, I mean, the, the, that doctor is like, the, I'm, I'm not surprised that he's like one of the best because he was just, he was good at it. So it was awesome. Burning flaps. Yep. He did wow. tell me too. He's like, he's like, it's going to smell. You're going to be able to smell it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you're actually going to set part of my eye on fire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh my God. But think crazy. about, you know, think about the math that they have to do. Just, this was just occurring to me. Like you have this, 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 the cornea is not the lens, right? In your eye. It's a, a cover over the pupil part, the iris, which is the thing that controls the size of your pupil is, is very delicate. This, it's this, what would you call it? It's a, it's a circular muscle that has to be able to change the size of the, yeah, it's an aperture, right? So it's very delicate. And then behind that is the lens, but the cornea is this, it's like the glass protective cover. Oh, you know, that's what it is. So was that thing, what was messed up? No, my lens, my lens can't focus properly, right? It's messed up somehow. So all of my glasses and all of my contacts have been to change the the shape of the, the shape of the light coming yeah. in so that when it hits my lens and gets shaped by the lens, <laughs> it ends up being focused. Right, right. Right. Well, the cornea and, and yes, I did have um, the cornea. My corneas were also both like misshapen. So they mm-hmm. already distorted the light before it hit the lens that couldn't focus them properly. Mm. But they knew all that. They did all these tests and they did all this stuff where they basically got the exact shape of the corneas. And then they used computers to do a shitload of math on those non-standard surfaces on how do we take this shape and turn it into a lens that will work with what that lens back there is doing. Oh, wow. And they basically turn your corneas into the contacts. Wow, that's cool, dude. And in the process, fix all the misshapenness that my corneas had built into them. So not only is it like clear vision like I would have gotten with contacts or glasses, but it also is correcting some stuff that no corrective lenses could ever fix, which is the misshapen nature of the corneas themselves. That misshapenness is completely gone now. So there's like certain kinds of doubling. When I look at distant lights, they don't have a starburst anymore. Even with glasses and contacts, they had that? Yeah, because wow. they couldn't fix that misshapen cornea. Oh, dude. That's so cool. it's like I have the clearest vision I've ever had in my life at this point. It's really Hell awesome. Yes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Man. That's really awesome. <clears throat> yeah, very cool. All right. So that's the LASIK update. Do we have, we need a laser sound? <laughs> <laughs> so <we> got... <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have a laser sound. <laughs> also, thanks to the many of you who sent um, well wishes and congratulations and and messages of support about quitting cigarettes. I really appreciate that. Uh, I know many of you have gone through the same thing or have tried to quit and, you know, so all reading all of that stuff was, was awesome. Thank you. And for those of you who felt the need to tell me that vapes are going to kill me even worse than <laughs> cigarettes are, I don't really care, <laughs> but I appreciate it as well. <laughs> I didn't quit cigarettes because I was worried they were killing me. Let's just put it that way. So, all right. Space Weather News. From spaceweather.com, a new CME just left the sun, and this is an update. So yesterday, June, uh, July 23rd, an unstable filament of magnetism in the sun's southern hemisphere exploded. The blast hurled a bright and interestingly textured CME into space. NOAA analysts have modeled the CME and determined that it has no Earth-directed component. Where's our, it's only a model. It's only a model. There we go. (laughs) Okay, so CME sparks auroras and and a Steve. So arriving almost exactly on time, a CME hit Earth's magnetic field on July 23rd. Uh, The impact sparked a G1-class geomagnetic storm with auroras from coast to coast in North America. Um, And it also made a Steve. Steve's is, Steve are not auroras. These purple-colored arcs are the glow from a supersonic river of gas, which flow through Earth's magnetosphere during some geomagnetic storms. Short for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement, Steve's are relatively recent discoveries. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff about pictures. And then they say the storm has subsided. Now there is a slight chance that it could flare up again because the solar wind velocity in the CME's wake remains above 500 kilometers per second. If it does reignite, however, we would expect no more than a minor G1 class activity. Current conditions, it looks like it is down now. Solar wind speed, 475.7 kilometers per second. Density is 4.89 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 96. And the neutron count is, ooh, wow, 
It is in the negative. First time what? ever. The neutron count. How do you is, get negative neutrons? It's it uh, the neutron. I'm sorry. The neutron average, right? The neutron count right now is negative 0.8 percent uh, of the space age average. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So gotcha. it's below zero on the space age average there. So maybe that's what this graph is showing: is the averages. Yeah. Okay. So KP index is two. Quiet. Twenty four hour max is three. Also quiet. Cool. Crypto update. Bitcoin is at $22,188. Ethereum is uh, $1,543. Also, we harvested since we did our last show, right? We did. Yeah. Harvested some. Yeah, we harvested uh, the hillside. Mm -hmm. And I learned that I need to take my, um, my estimations for weight and divide them by eight. Right? Or is it four? Four. Okay. I think it's four. Yeah, we got like a half ton. Yeah. Almost. And I was hoping for two. Yeah. So yeah, it would have been four. Yeah. Anyway, we're making rosé. But isn't that because we went up there and dropped a bunch? Yeah, but I, like I, was, young? I was looking at what was left over and oh. thinking like, man, maybe we'll get two tons off oh, of this. Oh, okay, but, okay. So we'll see. Next time I'll try to do an estimation and then we'll harvest it. Yeah. And, but I'll divide the estimation by four. <laughs> and we'll see. And then we'll be like, okay, we need to multiply it by two. <laughs> so just keep working on this. Yeah. Anyway, we got some rosé cooking away. How, how was it? How did it look yesterday? It was bubbling very slowly, a little bit foamy on the top. Um, so it's basically moving at the same speed. Did you test it? Did you use the hydrometer? And no. See? Okay. I didn't do the hydrometer. I did a temperature test. It's still 56 degrees, which is what you had marked it's very there slow. before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I stirred it. Very slightly. Okay. Just gave it a bit of a move. Pick up the leaves off the bottom. And then I put the lid back on and gassed it. So. All right. Yeah. Hopefully but yeah, it's... I didn't do... I saw that you had taken it out and put it in the... Um, graduated cylinder. Yeah, you measure. put it in the graduated cylinder. I didn't do that. So. Measuring the sugar levels. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, we'll see what it looks like tomorrow. It's still quite dark. Uh, yes. What did you think when you took it out into it, the cylinder? It looks like it's getting lighter. Okay, good. We were worried because basically stayed on the skins all day yeah so for like eight hours right and when you're making and a rosé you you want it to get a little bit like of color but not color. too much yeah and so it's pretty dark but i don't know we'll see yeah yeah okay uh i got a couple of news stories and i have two emails i can read yeah let's do the emails okay uh first one this is interesting it's called sphinx and uh, Armstrong. This is from, well, I don't know what that is. N-W-T-R-K-R. -R. So is that is that Lewis or Louis, when, the trumpet player, Armstrong? I can't that's, remember. Uh, that's got to be Louis. Is it Louis? Yeah. So it says, Kyle and Russ, I enjoy your podcast on Spotify, and I know you cannot drift too far from pyramids per your fans. <laughs> we got the Stick to the Pyramids stick crowd, the pyramids who are crowd. pretty mad by the end of this physics series. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> he says, though I do enjoy uh, you talking about subjects that none of us have a handle on. So I saw this pic on the interweb of Louis Armstrong serenading his wife with the Sphinx in the background and had to pass it on. So, yeah, there's a photograph. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, he says, yeah, I passed it on because, well, pyramids. I knew you two <laughs> would appreciate his attempt at acoustic levitation, as this is clearly <laughs> what he is doing to impress her. <laughs> Also, many thanks for corralling and guiding Randall Carlson through the Cosmographia podcast and allowing him the freedom to hold court and enlighten all with his wonderful and cle clearly non art insights. He is an American treasure. As I live in the Pacific Northwest, I am lucky enough to have experienced geology. I lived and traveled Missoula, Flathead Lake, Montana, eastern Washington Scablands, rafted the Snake River through Hell's Canyon, hiked the basalt cliffs of the Columbia Gorge, fished the Pacific Ocean, and monitored the Cascadia subduction zone living daily with the tsunami specter of the Juan, uh, Juan de Fuca plate. He says, I am appreciative of your, yours and Randall Carlson's background on the land and my family and I experience daily. So keep up the great work. I understand it is not easy, but you two and your dedicated crew make exploring these topics enjoyable. Best from NWTRKR. Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a great picture. Yeah, I wouldn't say, are we, I don't think we're, we're, we're 
as far as it goes with Cosmographia, we're just like helping facilitate the uh, technical stuff and then hanging out and being students. Yeah. I don't know that we're really guiding. No, not really. No, not, not much guiding. Sometimes we attempt, we make desperate attempts to drag him back on topic, <laughs> but it usually doesn't work. <laughs> uh, okay, one more. This is from Keith. <clears throat> this is a short one from Keith. He says, snakes, this is regards episode 250, black box granite time capsule. So he says, a monument of future knowledge left behind for future civilization. A monument of knowledge left behind for future civilizations. This is a great idea. It's a wonder nobody had thought of this before. But as above, so below, we should put a 10 by 10 by 10 in orbit with a camera and weather and radio recorder that needs to be reset every 40 or 50 or 100 years ago. If not reset, it would plot a course home to one of a few well known geological monuments as long as weather permitted. There it would maybe be safe until it was found. A few petabytes of data on an, on an auto-playable visual device might do the trick. And why just one? Each nation could have one with seeds and DNA and data, or multiple ones that would come down in 50 or 100 or 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 years, and life would find a way. <laughs> and our loss of history problems would be closer to extinction. So this is his idea on how to make a... How to make a time capsule. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you'd, you'd want a bunch of them because yes. some of them will fail. Right. Yeah, you need you need uh, redundancy. But that's cool. That's a cool idea. Like, it it, it, in, it comes back. Like, it does re-entry or whatever. Yeah. Every... yeah, the problem would be getting them to land safely on the ground. I mean, I guess you could have them splash down and then hope they wash up somewhere, but then they're going to be buried. Mm. Um, that's a good point. But the safest way to land something... That doesn't have a unless it's completely automated. Like, how are you going to land something in the mountains uh, mm. without it being a um, powered landing? Like, you can't just have it impact. It's you know. <laughs> hey, that, that would be a good way to get people's attention. <laughs> yeah, it would. if you can really make it black boxy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess you could you could <laughs> give it a bunch of parachutes. <laughs> if it's small enough, it could parachute in. Yeah. At least slow down. But if it, if you just let it just impact, it would make a crater. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if seeds and stuff would survive yeah, that, just... you know. Um, but data might, I guess. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. Just do a bunch of different ways. Yeah. Have some splash down. Have some parachute in. Have some explode in the air and spread the, D the seeds and DNA, you know. If it's 10,000 years from now, of course, that might be... You may be uh, doing something dangerous to that those future people. Yeah, it's like the last surviving tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! It spreads a, a million seeds of something that destroys everything they've got. <laughs> you know. But yeah, there's all kinds of interesting ideas on how to do that. I agree. Putting something in space is a is that seems safer. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I've got a news story, probably just going to do one at this point, maybe two. This is from Science Daily. A researcher links real encounter with milky seas to satellite pictures. So I thought this was kind of cool because it's sort of Fortean. I think we may have heard something similar to this. And this person actually okay. um, found it. Well, anyway, let's let's see what it is. Um, Milky Seas, the rare phenomenon of glowing areas on the ocean's surface that can cover hundreds of square miles, are not new to scientists at Colorado State University. Mm. They have previously demonstrated the use of satellites to see these elusive phenomena. What was missing were photographic observations of Milky Seas observed from the Earth's surface and from space at the same time. Until now. A new paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Stephen Miller, professor at the uh, Department of Atmospheric Science and director of CSU's Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere, compares satellite observations of a 2019 Milky Sea event off the coast of Java to photographic evidence from the sailing ship Ganesha, a 16-meter private yacht. <clears throat> the yacht happened to be sailing in the Milky Seas at the same time. 
Unsure of what they had encountered, the yacht's crew provided CSU their in enlightening footage after learning of its expertise in satellite observations and Miller's particular interest in capturing milky seas from space. Miller has previously compared satellite observations to tales from maritime lore to try to understand how the rarely encountered mystery of the deep works. The crew of the Ganesha described the sea as a luminous snow field. A crew member recounted what she saw. Both the color and intensity of the glow was akin to glow-in-the-dark stars or stickers or, uh, or some watches that have glowing parts on the hands, mm -hmm. a very soft glow that was gentle on the eyes. GoPro and smartphone photographs clearly show the glow of the ocean, spreading from horizon to horizon, shining through the rails of the boat. A comparison image that has been edited to reflect the perception of the crew at the time accounts for difficulties in capturing such low-light signals on commercial, non-optimized photographic hardware. Mm. According to the captain of the Ganesha, the glow appeared to be emanating from a fair depth below the ocean's surface, perhaps as deep as 30 feet. A bucket of water was drawn from the glowing sea containing many pinpoints of steady light instead of the flashing or sparkling light observed by more commonly experienced forms of marine bioluminescence, which we've witnessed many times yeah. at the beach. Um, so these are just, they're not sparkling, they're just steady glow. As, as described briefly in the paper, this sheds some light onto the hypothesis of milky seas. Some ideas for milky sea formation suggest a surface slick of bioluminescence, but the observations from the Ganesha suggest that the phenomenon happens over a much deeper volume, providing information for researchers studying the phenomenon to consider. What the Ganesha's crew's, uh, crew's descriptions of their encounter, along with GPS reported track logs and dates in hand, oh, I'm sorry, with the Ganesha crew's descriptions of their encounter, along with GPS reported track logs and dates in hand, Miller was able to match satellite images from the day-night band sensor aboard NOAA's uh, SNPP. It's just like a whole bunch of acronyms. <laughs> the DNB aboard the NOAA's SNPP <laughs> and the NOAA-20 satellites. Piecing together the data, Miller found that the Ganesha's track intercepted the southern part of the glowing seas. Despite being far from the brightest regions of this milky sea, an area where some of the clouds, also observed by the day-night band sensor, appeared as dark silhouettes against the glowing waters, the Ganesha was still sailing through a region of ocean whose glow was readily detectable from 500 miles above in space. Wow. Measuring the amount of light seen by the instrument for both the actual track of the Ganesha and a hypothetical trans transect through the brightest area of the Milky Seas provides the numbers needed to start to understand how these light displays develop. Moreover, Knowing how the ocean appears from the surface gives researchers more context on what they're seeing from space. Importantly, with the eyewitness confirmation in hand, confidence in the space-based measurements skyrockets, Miller said, as they become vi a viable resource to help future expeditions guide research vessels um, to target and study Milky Seas in detail. So do they have any idea what's causing <clears throat> it? I or think did he, I miss that? No, it, it, there's one more section. Okay. Uh, opportunities to study unresolved scientific mysteries are exceedingly rare in modern science, which is why these never-before-seen observations are so compelling. Understanding what a satellite sees and what's actually happening on the ground, or in this case, in the ocean, requires observations that often scientists just can't get. The, busy, the biggest missing link in our study from last year on day-night band-based Milky Sea detection and highlighting the 2019 Java event was the lack of ground truth, Miller said. But this current study provides it. It was a great relief to get this contact from the Ganesha crew. Moving forward, uh, CSU's groundbreaking and leading research capabilities in satellite observations may provide new opportunities to learn more about the rarest and most mysterious things happening in the ocean. Come on, tell me what it, you think it is. Um, they're not saying anything. I thought there was a section on it. Oh, well. Did you know that the opportunity to study actual true mysteries is really rare these days? <laughs> they basically basically got everything figured out. It has no, <laughs> there is no speculation as to what this is in the story. Okay. <clears throat> 
I thought there was. No, that's all right. Well, the main reason I, I wanted to read this is because of the fact that we have no idea what's going on. Yeah, here. of course. Yeah, that's cool. So it kind of just lends credence to a lot of the stuff that you hear in the Fortean yes. stuff. You know, yeah. like that. Yeah, these things. There are very strange phenomena going on in places, and we, scientists can't just jump up and run and go study them. Right. Yeah. So they need helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, I have a couple more, but we're at 30 minutes already. You yeah. want to just take a break? Yeah. And then we'll, I'll do these some other time. I just wanted to, <clears throat> real quick, just mention the uh, James Webb Telescope. What I want to talk to you about tonight is, strictly speaking, not on the character of physical laws, because... One might imagine, at least, that one's talking about nature when one's talking about the character of physical laws. But I don't want to talk about nature, but rather how we stand relative to nature now. I want to tell you what we think we know, and what there is to guess, and how one goes about guessing. Someone suggested that it would be ideal if, if as I went along, I would slowly explain how to guess the laws and then create a new law for you right as I went along. I don't know whether I'll be able to do that. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, with the final installment here of the Feynman lectures on the character of physical law. And uh, I love this chapter. This uh, this lecture, because this is this is all about what we have to do, right? I mean, this is what's left to yeah. do <laughs> for everyone, right? Yeah, it is a good chapter. I had a hard time leaving things out of this chapter, so yeah. we're going to read most of it. But there are sections I didn't read. So again, we do encourage people to either pick up the book or. You know, get on YouTube and watch the lectures. They are available for free. I am putting the links to the lectures in the show notes. So continuing with what Feynman was saying there in the break. First, I want to tell you what the present situation is, what it is that we know about physics. You may think that I have told you everything already because in the lectures I have told you all the great principles that are known. But the principles must be principles about something, the principle of the conservation of energy, relates to the energy of something, and the quantum mechanical laws are quantum mechanical laws about something, and all of these principles added together still do not tell us what the content is of the nature that we are talking about. I will tell you a little, then, about the stuff on which all of these principles are supposed to have been working. First of all, there is matter, and remarkably enough, all matter is the same. The matter of which the stars are made is known to be the same as the matter on the earth. The character of the light that is emitted by those stars gives a, a kind of fingerprint by which we can tell that there are the same kinds of atoms there as on the earth. The same kinds of atoms appear to be in living creatures as in non-living creatures. Frogs are made of the same group as rocks, only in different arrangements. So that makes our problem simpler. We have nothing but atoms, all the same, everywhere. Today, our, although our theory of what goes on outside the nucleus of the atom seems precise and complete enough, in the sense that given enough time we can calculate anything as accurately as it can be measured, it turns out that the forces between neutrons and protons, which constitute the nucleus, are not so completely known and are not understood at all well. What I mean is that we do not today understand the forces between neutrons and protons to the extent that if you wanted me to, and gave me enough time in computers, I could calculate exactly the energy levels of carbons or something like that. We do not know enough. Although we can do the corresponding thing for the energy levels of the outside electrons of the atoms, we cannot for the nucleus, since the nuclear forces are still not understood very well. In order to find out more about this, experimenters have gone on to study phenomena at very high energy. They hit neutrons and protons together at very high energy to produce 
to produce peculiar things. And by studying these peculiar things, we hope to understand better the forces between neutrons and protons. Pandora's box has been opened by these experiments. Although all we really wanted was to get a better idea of the forces between neutrons and protons, when we hit these things together hard, we discovered that there are more particles in the world. In fact, more than four dozen other particles have been dredged up in an attempt to understand these forces. In addition to that, while the dredge was digging up all this mud, it picked up a couple of pieces that are irrelevant to the problem of nuclear forces. One of them is called a mu meson or muon, and the other is a neutrino which goes with it. So the mu meson is the what the muon is what they're using to yeah, scan to pyramids. Scan pyramids, that's right. There are two kinds of neutrino, one which goes with the electron and one which goes with the mu meson. Incidentally, most amazingly, all the laws of the muon and its neutrino are now known, as far as we can tell experimentally, and the law is that they behave in precisely the same way as the electron and its neutrino, except that the mass of the mu meson is 207 times heavier than the electron, but that is the only difference known between those objects, which is rather curious. Four dozen other particles is a frightening array, plus the antiparticles. They have various names, mesons, pions, kaons, lambda, sigma. It does not make any difference. With four dozen particles, there are going to be a lot of names. But it turns out that these particles come in families, which helps us a little. Actually, some of these so-called particles last such a short time that there are debates about whether it is in fact possible to define their very existence. But I will not enter into that debate. So we've talked about this. The fact that once you raise these things up to higher enough energy levels and slam them against each other, you end up with these particles that last a millionth of a second or yeah. whatever. And is it, can you really classify it as a particle? And you were saying that they're like attenuated frequencies. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Right? Like if thinking of it in terms of resonance, um, the things that are still jiggling, as Feynman puts it, are all seemingly the same. Right? Yeah. They're, there's all of these similar things throughout, like all the atoms and whatever yeah. the pieces of the atoms, but they're all the same. And so they all have this particular resonance. And then when you smash them together, other frequencies start ringing. But because they're completely out of tune with the resonance of everything else, they just, they're just attenuated. Yeah, very quickly. This is an idea that's based on um, a, a, an ether-like medium. Right. Everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so families of particles. So in order to illustrate the family idea, Feynman says, I will take the cases of a neutron and a proton. The neutron and the proton have the same mass to within a tenth of a percent or so. One is 1,836, and the other is 1,839 times as heavy as an electron. More remarkable is the fact that for the nuclear forces, the strong forces inside the nucleus, the force between two protons is the same as between a proton and a neutron, and is the same again between a neutron and a neutron. In other words, from the strong nuclear forces, you cannot tell a proton from a neutron. So it is a symmetry law. Neutrons may be substituted for protons without changing anything, provided you are only talking about the strong forces. But if you change a neutron for a proton, you do have a terrific difference because the proton carries an electrical charge and the neutron does not. By electrical measurement, you can immediately see the difference between a proton and a neutron. So this symmetry that you can replace one by the other is what we call an approximate symmetry. It is right for the strong interactions of nuclear forces, but it is not right in any deep sense of nature because it does not work for electricity. This is called a partial symmetry, and we have to struggle with these partial symmetries. Now that the families have been extended, it turns out that substitutions of the type of neutron for proton can be extended over a wider range of particles, but the accuracy is still lower. The statement that neutrons can always be substituted for protons is only approximate. It is not true for electricity. But the wider substitutions, which have been found possible, give still a poorer symmetry. However, these partial symmetries have helped to gather the particles into families 
and thus locate places, thus to locate places where particles are missing and thus help discover new ones. Hmm. This kind of game of roughly guessing at family relationships and so on is illustrative of the kind of preliminary sparring which one does with nature before really discovering some deep and fundamental law. Examples are very important in the previous history of science. For example, uh, Mendeleev's discovery of the periodic table of the elements is analogous to this game. It is the first step, but the complete description of the reason for the atomic table came much later with atomic theory. In the same way, organization of the knowledge of nuclear levels was made by Maria Meyer and Jensen in what they called the shell model of nuclei some years ago. Physics is in an analogous game in which a reduction of the complexity is made by some approximate guesses. In addition to these particles, we have all the principles that we were talking about before, the principles of symmetry, of relativity, and that things must behave quantum mechanically, and, combining that with relativity, that all conservation laws must be local. If we put all these principles together, we discover that there are too many they are inconsistent with each other. It seems that if we take quantum mechanics plus relativity plus the proposition that everything has to be local plus a number of tacit assumptions, we get inconsistency because we get infinity for various things when we calculate them. And if we get infinity, how can we ever say that this agrees with nature? An example of these tacit assumptions, which I mentioned, about which we are too prejudiced to understand the real significance, is such a proposition as the following. If you calculate the chance for every possibility, say it is 50% probability that this will happen and 25% that that will happen, etc., it should add up to one. We think that if you add all the alter alternatives, you should get 100% probability. This seems reasonable, but reasonable things are where the trouble always is. Another such proposition, is, so is he implying that when you have, that in some cases... I mean, I couldn't tell when I was reading this, but is he implying that in some cases in physics, when you add up all the probabilities, you don't quite get to 100% or maybe you get more? Is that what he's saying? Yeah, I guess maybe. That's kind of what I thought. But Yeah. Or is this just an example of a kind of, like in other words, he's, this isn't what happens, but he's just saying here's a, an assumption that might be made. Okay, that could be. I couldn't tell. Because he says an example of these tacit assumptions which I mentioned... And then he gives this example. I'm like, so are you saying that sometimes in physics we don't quite get to 100% probability when we add up all the probabilities? Or is this just a... That seems likely to me because... Because <laughs> 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 we don't know all the possibilities. Yeah. So th we're missing something, right? Mm -hmm. Or you get more than 100%. And that you means got you've, too ca much. you've calculated the probabilities wrong. You've got too much in there. Yeah. <laughs> Or he's actually implying that sometimes the reasonable assumption that you should get 100% is not true. Okay. Could be. Because like he was saying with quantum mechanics, it's like you expect it to act a certain way, but sometimes in physics it doesn't do that. But I think what he's saying when, when that happens is that in, in, in this case that we've got something wrong. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, he says, this seems reasonable that you should get 100% probability, but reasonable things are where the trouble always is. Mm -hmm. So I'm just not sure exactly that, what that he means That does sound by like that. a yeah. quantum mechanical statement yeah. there. <laughs> Another such proposition is that the energy of something must always be positive. It cannot be negative. Yeah, you hear that? There's no such thing as negative energy. <laughs> There's no such thing as... <laughs> But he's actually he's actually saying that that sounds like a reasonable proposition, but it may not be true. <laughs> <laughs> Another proposition, which is probably added in before we get inconsistency, is what we call... Yeah, so he is saying that these are tacit assumptions. Okay. Another problem, a proposition that's added in before we get inconsistency is what is called causality, which is something like the idea that effects cannot precede their causes. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, like the whole retro cause, can something that takes place in the future affect the present or something that's happening in the present affect right. the past? That doesn't follow the, uh, the distinction of past and, and future or whatever. So uh, actually, no one has made a model in which you disregard the proposition about the probability 
or you disregard the causality, which is also consistent with quantum mechanics, relativity, locality, and so on. So he is saying that these are actual problems when they're combining these things. Mm -hmm. So we really do not know exactly what it is that we are assuming that gives us the difficulty producing infinities. This is a nice problem. However, it turns out that it is possible to sweep the infinities under the rug by a certain crude skill, and temporarily we are able to keep on calculating. I wonder if this is the kind of the, the shut up and calculate thing that people have talked about with quantum mechanics, right? You can just sweep those nasty infinities under the rug and keep, keep crunching those numbers. Yeah. So he says, okay, that is the present situation. Now I am going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what would be implied if this law that we guessed is true. Then we compare the result of the computation to nature with experiment or experience, compare it directly with observation to see if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It does not make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It does not make any difference how smart you are or who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong. That is all there is to it. It is true that one has to check a little to make sure that it is wrong because whoever did the experiment may have re reported it incorrectly or there may have been some feature in the experiment that was not noticed, some dirt or something, <laughs> or the man who computed the consequences, even though it may have been the one who made the guesses, could have made some mistake in the analysis. These are obvious remarks, so when I say, if it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong, I mean, after the experiment has been checked, the calculations have been checked, and the thing has been rubbed back and forth a few times to make sure that the consequences are logical consequences from the guess, and that it, in fact, disagrees with a very carefully checked experiment. This will give you a somewhat wrong impression of science. It suggests that we keep on guessing possibilities and comparing them with experiment, and this is to put, uh, and this is to put experiment into a rather weak position. In fact, experimenters have a certain individual character. They like to do experiments even if nobody has guessed yet. <laughs> And they very often do their experiments in a region in which people know the theorists have not made any guesses. For instance, we may know a great many laws, but do not know whether they really work at high energy because it is just a good guess that they work at high energy. Experimenters have tried experiments at higher energy, and in fact, every once in a while, the experiment produces trouble. That is, it produces a discovery that one of the things we thought was right is wrong. In this way, experiment can produce unexpected results, and that starts us guessing again. One instance of an unexpected result is the Mu Meson and its neutrino, which was not guessed by anybody at all before it was discovered. And even today, nobody yet has any method of guessing by which this would be a natural result. Wow. So that... I, I think that's why th it's interesting because like throughout this book or this series of lectures, he has brought this particle up multiple times. So I feel like this is something that just happened mm. in, in the time that he was giving these lectures and it's on his mind. And he's just like, okay, where the hell did this thing come from? <laughs> you know, because no one had any clue that it would be there. And yet the experiments show it and it's, 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 it's a Mason with its own, you know, neutrino. And it came out of, and, and, you know, to to the physicist, it came out of nowhere. Okay. Well, uh, muons were discovered in 1936. Okay, so not just so before. It, but, yeah. They, were, they found it while studying cosmic radiation. Hmm. Anderson noticed particles that curved differently from electrons and other known particles when passed through a magnetic field. Hmm. <laughs> so, they were Caltech. That base on is curving the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so he says, you can see, of course, that with this method we can attempt to disprove any definite theory. If we have a definite theory, a real guess, from which we can conveniently compute consequences, 
which can be compared with experiment, then in principle, we can get rid of any theory. There is always the possibility of proving any definite theory wrong. But notice that we can never prove it right. Suppose that you invent a good guess and calculate the consequences and discover every time that the consequences you have calculated agree with experiment. The theory is then right? No, it is simply not proven wrong. In the future, you could compute a wider range of consequences. There could be a wider range of experiments, and you might then discover that the thing is wrong. That is why laws like Newton's laws for the motion of planets lasted such a long time. He guessed the law of gravitation, calculated all kinds of consequences for the system and so on, compared them with experiment, and it took several hundred years before the slight error of the motion of Mercury was observed. During all that time, the theory had not been proved wrong and could be taken temporarily to be right. But it could never be proved right because tomorrow's experiment might succeed in proving wrong what you thought was right. We, are, we never are definitely right. We can only be sure we are wrong. However, it is rather remarkable how we can have some ideas which will last so long. Yes. I love so that section. Good. Yeah, this is, we like, we had rants about this early on in the podcast. Yeah. About how science is supposed to work. And yeah, no theory is is ever completely 100% right. It's never right. proven. It's just, it's just right. yeah, it's never proven true. It's just hasn't been proven wrong yet. <laughs> That's right. And it doesn't matter how long they last. They're not true. They're not proven true. Right. They could be true. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think you're right here. The muon neutrino. Identification of the muon neutrino as distinct from the electron neutrino was accomplished in 1962. There we go. On the basis of the results of a particle accelerator experiment. Mm -hmm. That's it. So he's just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, one of the ways of stopping science would be only to do experiments in the region where you know the law. But experimenters search most diligently and with the greatest effort in exactly those places where it seems most likely that we can prove our theories wrong. In other words, we are trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible, because only in that way can we find progress. This is another... That is awesome. Yeah. This is another... Now, this, this is idealized... Obviously, but yeah, yeah. this is the way it's again supposed to work. Like the 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 concept of science being always right is just it's no, that's not how it works. Well, you, you have to think you too, spend all of your time trying to figure out how wrong you are. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you have to understand too where he's coming from. Right. He he was part of the um, the atomic bomb, like when they were building Manhattan the, Project. The Manhattan yeah. Project. And that's exactly what they were doing. There was no, in other words, there weren't politics involved yep. in the same way that politics is, is, gets involved in science Yeah. today. In that scenario, it was like, we have to figure this out before the enemies do. Right. And so we need to do all the experiments everywhere where we are most likely to be wrong. And we got to find out how wrong we are as fast as possible. Right. So they're, you know. Yes. I think that that played a big role in... in I agree, yeah. It, it's a kind of... Um, uh, how would you... What would you think of it as like? It's like a kind of... Unfortunately, that sort of situation with war brings about this kind of desperation. Yes. Where you just get rid of... like Your biases and all biases, this favorite theories and everything. And politics, yeah. All of this goes out the window because what you're trying to do is save your civilization. Or that's what you think, even if... You, even if it's wrong, but you're, right, yeah, that's what they're. That was a situation they were in. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and I think rightly so. I mean, yeah. So it's it it becomes a kind of you, you shave away all of the bullshit that comes that can come along with science. Uh, that gets that's not science. Yeah, all the stuff that gets added onto it during peacetime, <laughs> right? <laughs> So this is probably part of the reason why science can progress so quickly during during war, especially when, you know, the, the, those world wars were like uniquely a kind of technological battle. Uh, yes. 
in in that it it I mean, okay, new technology has uh throughout history, new technology has occasionally caused, you know, one side or another to win a war. But for a long time throughout at least known history, it was more about how many people you had or mm-hmm. what your geolo- uh, geographical situation was, mm-hmm. you know, or how brilliant your your tacticians were. Weather. Yeah, weather, <laughs> yes. You know, whether people thought they saw flying saucers in the sky when they were fighting stuff. You know, it's just yeah. like there's all kinds of stuff. But every once in a while, like somebody would invent something like the longbow or the crossbow or the chariot, right? And it would just cause battles to just be completely won for one side, a new technology. Mm-hmm. And this would happen every couple of centuries. But that world war that Feynman was involved with, with the, with the, with the Manhattan project was like the whole thing was a technological front and everyone was racing to either catch up to the other guy or to surpass them in some way, mm-hmm. you know, and it caused the, it caused, you know, computers to be built and just, it started the yeah. modern age really. Yeah. So he's a product of that. And it's it's interesting how clearly he sees it and so, the, way he, the way he states yeah, it. Yeah, so there's a there's a another book that he has. Uh it may be I uh, it might be the one that's uh surely you're joking. Oh yeah. Mr. Feynman or whatever. Yeah. I can't remember which. He's got a couple of books. They're all great. Yeah. Anyway, uh in one he he details his experience on the committee for the Challenger explosion. Yeah. Yes. Now in that situation, he's like the only one. Yeah, that's right. Doing the science. Yeah. And not having a bias. Yep. Or at least keeping it at bay. Yeah. And not doing a bunch of CYA or. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, yeah. And when so you he, read through it, it's crazy how. Uh, he's just being roadblocked the yeah. whole time. Right. From so many different directions. Yep. It's only, I think, if I remember correctly, it's only when he really gets down in there where the guys who are working on the engines are doing stuff. Those are the only dudes who are like real, you know, he's down there with the engineers. Yeah. And he's just like, okay, now we can actually talk serious business. <laughs> yeah. And then he's talking to what, what was it? And this is a kind of a digression, but he's talking to a couple of those guys who work on one of the main engines. Yeah. And they're showing them, showing him this problem they have. And yeah. it's, it turns out to be some kind of whistle. Right. Yeah. 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 He's like, is it whistling? They're like, yeah. They're like every, Three or four flights, we have to completely replace the entire apparatus because it's there's this vibration that's tearing the, the thing apart. Yeah, and he's like, "Yeah, it's whistling." You know, while it's burning, it's like, "Wee!" It's like make like obviously <laughs> there's a it's, vibration. It's not, there's a vibration that you can't. Yeah, but and I, I would I just remember reading that and being like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, if you had something that powerful, and for whatever reason that builds up a resonance inside there, it's just gonna it it causes enormous amounts of stress to all the metal. Yeah, yeah. Does he figure it out? I can't remember if he, because he does this a lot of. Well, you know, he names it, and they're like, "Yes, that's exactly what it's like." <laughs> and I think that helped them figure out what was going uh, on. But he just like he was just like, "Yeah, it sounds like it's you know it's whistling." <laughs> 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 he does this kind of stuff multiple times. Like yes. he he just I don't know if he he's really lucky. He's he's definitely a lucky person. He is lucky, but he's yeah. also like he has this way of thinking that just. He thinks around corners and yeah. people don't, you know, where people don't expect love, where he's coming from. I love from. the lock picking stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the stories he, he tells. breaks into the general's safe. Like the general gets a brand new safe and he looks at it and he's like, I can break in that. And the general's like, yeah, right. You know, because he's bragging about it. And so he goes back there and in two minutes he yeah. breaks into the <laughs> safe. <laughs> yeah. And the general gets so mad yep. and has the thing dragged out of there. Yep. <laughs> and he does, doesn't he do a different one? He's like, he goes into the guy's office on some pretext, like some pretense, like I need to talk to you. And he just leans against the safe and he picks it from behind his back while he's talking so to the guy. He, everybody had a filing cabinet during the Manhattan <laughs> oh, that's Project, what it was, right? Yeah. They had a filing cabinet and they put locks on all the filing cabinets because yeah. it's, you know, super top, top secret files in there. Yeah. And he has a filing cabinet with a lock. All the locks are the same. Yeah. And so he learns how the lock works. Yeah. And he figures out that when the file cabinet drawer is open, he can determine the first two numbers. Yeah. Yeah. And so when he, so he goes in, everybody's, <laughs> he goes into their offices to talk to him and their filing cabinet drawers are always open. Yeah. So he just stands there and he fumbles with the thing while he's talking to him <laughs> right in front of him. <laughs> he's like spinning the little lock and stuff, you know, just like chatting with him. Yeah. And, through feeling and occasionally glancing at it, he 
knows what the first two numbers are and he writes them all down. <laughs> <laughs> and so in a lot of cases, like one guy's first two numbers are one and three. Yeah. And so he's like, well, the other number's seven. Yeah. It's 137 because yeah, this is a number that we're all worried about, right? right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, some physicist has got 137 for his combination. <laughs> oh my God, it's great. Yeah. And There's... then that ends up saving their asses because one guy was out of town and they desperately needed these files. They were doing all these computations yeah. and they were like, oh my God, we got to have it. And they couldn't get a hold of the guy. Yep. And they couldn't get into his file. They couldn't. And Feynman just is like, I'll be right back. And he comes <laughs> yeah. back with the files and they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh dude he's great yeah the other books are awesome but yeah i just he's he's definitely a product of that environment as a scientist but then he he he's he is what you're saying here he's saying an idealized thing yeah, he's telling he, you how it's supposed to because work. he definitely experienced yeah the other stuff right you know? for sure yeah all right i think we can take a break Right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. All right, we'll be right back. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. It's true, however, that one has to check a little bit to make sure that it's wrong because someone who did the experiment may have reported incorrectly or there may have been some feature in the experiment that wasn't noticed, like some kind of dirt and so on. That's an obvious check. Furthermore, the man who computed the consequences, even it may have been the same one who made the guesses, may have made some mistake in the analysis. Those are obvious remarks. So when I say if it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong, I mean after the experiment has been checked, the calculations have been checked, and the thing has been rubbed back and forth a few times to make sure that the consequences are logical consequences from the hype, from the guess, and that in fact it disagrees with a very carefully checked experiment. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Servant Podcast. 32, 33% brain expansion guaranteed. Especially on Feynman stuff. I, I feel brain expansion after going through this book. Hell yeah. And having these discussions. Well, I don't know. I feel like maybe my brain is smaller. That is a brain expansion. Okay. It is a kind of expansion. <laughs> yeah. The dumber you feel, the more you know you didn't know. <laughs> That's right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> So we are joined by the Watcher. Um, Watcher, do you want to come on and say anything? I don't know. I couldn't tell if you were in a noisy environment or not. But yeah, why don't you? It's been a while. It's been, yeah. Why don't it's you been come? difficult to get together these days. Yeah. It has far too long. And maybe I'm in a noisy environment. Not too bad. Not too, yeah. All right. Fair enough. So yeah, Kyle, think of it like having a like Ziploc bag full of cornflakes. <laughs> Going through these conversations just smashed all the cornflakes into crumbs. <laughs> and so now you have more room in the bag for more cornflakes. <laughs> That's one of the best analogies yet. <laughs> Great to have you back, Watcher. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's get going on this. Good to okay. be back. <laughs> okay, so Feynman was saying... In other words, we are trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible, because only in that way can we find progress. For example, today, among ordinary low-energy phenomena, we do not know where to look for trouble. We think everything is all right, and so there's no particularly big program looking for trouble in nuclear reactions or in superconductivity. In these lectures, I am concentrating on discovering fundamental laws, the whole range of physics which is interesting, includes also an understanding at another level of these phenomena like superconductivity and nuclear reactions in terms of the fundamental laws. But I am talking now about discovering trouble or something wrong with the fundamental laws. And since among low energy phenomena, nobody knows where to look, all the experiments today in this field of finding out a new law are of high energy. Another thing I must point out 
is that you cannot prove a vague theory wrong. If the guess that you made is poorly expressed and rather vague, and the method you use for figuring out the consequences is a little vague, you are not sure and you say, well, I think everything's right because it's all due to so-and-so and such-and-such -and -such do this and that more or less, and I can sort of explain how this works. Then you see this theory is good because it cannot be proved wrong. Also, if the process of computing the consequences is indefinite, then with a little skill, any experimental results can be made to look like the expected consequences. So you are probably familiar with, with that in other fields. A hates his mother. The reason is, of course, because she did not caress him or love him enough when he was a child. But if you investigate, you find out that, as a matter of fact, she did love him very much and everything was all right. Well, then, it was because she was overindulgent when he was a child. <laughs> By having a vague theory, it is possible to get either result. The cure for this one is the following. If it were possible to state exactly ahead of time how much love is not enough and how much love is overindulgent, then there would be a perfectly legitimate theory against which you could make tests. It is usually said when this is pointed out, well, when you're dealing with psychological matters, things can't be defined so precisely. Well, yes, but then you cannot claim to know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> trash trash these other fields yeah. here. <laughs> you will be horrified to hear that we have examples in physics of exactly the same kind. We have these approximate symmetries, which work something like this. You have an approximate symmetry, so you calculate a set of consequences, supposing it to be perfect. When compared with experiment, it does not agree. Of course, the symmetry you are supposed to expect is approximate. So if the, agreement, uh, if the agreement is pretty good, you say, nice. While if the agreement is very poor, you say, well, this particular thing must be especially sensitive to the failure of the symmetry. Now, you may laugh, but we have to make progress in that way. When a subject is first new and these particles are new to us, this jockeying around, this feeling way of guessing at the results is the beginning of any science. The same thing is true of the symmetry proposition in physics, as is true of psychology, so do not laugh too hard. It is necessary in the beginning to be very careful. It is easy to fall into the deep, into the deep end by this kind of vague theory. It is hard to prove it wrong, and it takes a certain skill and experience not to walk off the plank in the game. In this process of guessing, computing consequences, and comparing with experiment, we can get stuck at various stages. We may get stuck in the guessing stage when we have no ideas, or we may get stuck in the computing stage. For example, Yukawa guessed an idea for the nuclear forces in 1934, but nobody could compute the consequences because the mathematics was too difficult, and so they could not compare his idea with experiment. The theories remained for a long time until we discovered all these extra particles which were not contemplated by Yukawa, and therefore it is undoubtedly not as simple as the way Yukawa did it. Another place where you can get stuck is at the experimental end. For example, the quantum theory of gravitation is going very slowly, if at all, because all the experiments that you can do never involve quantum mechanics and gravitation at the same time. The gravity force is too weak compared with the electrical force. Because I am a theoretical physicist and more delighted with this end of the problem, I want now to concentrate on how you make guesses. As I said before, it is not of any importance where the guess comes from. It is only important that it should agree with experiment and that it should be as definite as possible. Then you say, that's very simple. You set up a machine a great computing machine which has a random wheel in it that makes a succession of guesses, and each time it guesses a hypothesis about how nature should work, it computes immediately the consequences and makes a comparison with a list of experimental results it has at the other end. In other words, guessing is a dumb man's job. But actually, it, <laughs> but actually, it is quite the opposite, and I will try to explain why. The first problem is how to start. You say, well, I'd start off with all the known principles but all the principles that are known are inconsistent with each other, so something has to be removed. We get a lot of letters from people insisting that we ought to make holes in our guesses. You see, you, you make a hole to make a room for a new guess. <laughs> Somebody says, you know, you people always say that space is continuous. How do you know when you get to a small enough dimension that there really are enough points between? 
and it isn't just a lot of dots separated by little distances. Or, they say, you know those quantum mechanical amplitudes you told me about? They're so complicated and absurd. What makes you think those are right? Maybe they aren't right. Such remarks are obvious and are perfectly clear to anybody who is working on this problem. It does not do any good to point this out. The problem is not only what might be wrong, but what precisely might be substituted in place of it. In the case of a continuous space, suppose the precise proposition is that space really consists of a series of dots, and that the space between them does not mean anything, and that the dots are in a kind of cubic array. Then we can prove immediately that this is wrong. It doesn't work. The problem is not just to say something might be wrong, but to replace it by something, and that is not so easy. As soon as any really definite idea is substituted, it becomes almost immediately apparent that it does not work. The second difficulty is that there is an infinite number of possibilities of these simple types. It's something like this. You're sitting, working very hard. You have worked for a long time trying to open a safe. Then some <laughs> Joe comes along who knows nothing about what you are doing except, what, except that you are trying to open the safe. And he says, well, why don't you try the combination 10, 20, and 30? <laughs> because you're busy and you've tried a lot of things maybe you haven't all maybe you have already tried tried 10 20 30 or maybe you know already that the middle number is 32 not 20 or maybe you know as a matter of fact that it is a five digit combination so please do not send me any letters trying to tell me how the thing is going to work <laughs> i read them I always read them to make sure that I have not already thought of what is suggested. But it takes too long to answer them because they are usually in the class of try 10, 20, 30. As usual, nature's imagination far surpasses our own. And as we have seen from the other theories, which are subtle and deep, to get such a subtle and deep guess is not so easy. One must be really clever to guess, and it is not possible to do it blindly by machine. He throws this thing in about people writing him. Yeah. <laughs> he reads all the letters, too. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, this is what I do. Yeah. I felt... The other thing that's funny is like, this. you know what this reminded me of? The 10, 20, 30 was like, when you're like, man, I lost whatever. And they're like, did you, you check, your, check pockets? your pockets? Yeah. <laughs> did you look in your car? <laughs> <laughs> and now we always say that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Every time Russ is like, oh, I can't find those. Did yeah, you check your did pockets? Did you check your pockets? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he says, I want to discuss now the art of guessing nature's laws. It is an art. How is it done? One way you might suggest is to look at history to see how the other guys did it. So we look at history. And we must start with Newton. He had a situation where he had incomplete knowledge. And he was able to guess the laws by putting together ideas which were all relatively close to experiment. There was not a great distance between the observations and the tests. That was the first way, but today it does not work so well. The next guy who did something great was Maxwell, who obtained the laws of electricity and magnetism. What he did was this. He put together all the laws of electricity due to Faraday and other people who came before him. And he looked at them and realized that they were mathematically inconsistent. In order to straighten it out, he had to add one term to an equation. He did this by inventing for himself a model of idler wheels and gears and so on in space. He found what the new law was, but nobody paid much attention because they did not believe in the idler, idler wheels. We do not believe in the idler wheels today, but the equations that he obtained were correct. <laughs> so the logic might be wrong, but the answer was correct. That is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he built so, a model in his mind of how to explain to himself how to add this other variable into the math to make it consistent. Yeah. And the model is totally describing something that isn't true, and yet the, the, the math that he it came up with was correct. It helped yeah. him get there. It helped him get there, yeah. He's like, yeah, we don't buy the wheels thing either, but this is, he's still got the right answer. That's wild. <laughs> in the case of relativity, the discovery was completely different. There was an accumulation of paradoxes. The known laws gave inconsistent results. This was a new kind of thinking, a thinking in terms of discussing the possible symmetries of laws. This was especially difficult because for the first time it was realized how long something like Newton's laws could seem right and still ultimately be wrong. 
Also, it was difficult to accept that ordinary ideas of time and space, which seemed so instinctive, could be wrong. Quantum mechanics was discovered in two independent ways, which is a lesson. There again, and even more so, an enormous number of paradoxes were discovered experimentally, things that absolutely could not be explained in any way by what was known. It was not that the knowledge was incomplete, but that the knowledge was too complete. Your prediction was that this should happen, and it did not. The two different routes were, by, were one by Schrodinger, who guessed the equation, and the other by Heisenberg, who argued that you must analyze what is measurable. These two different philosophical methods led to the same discovery in the end. Man, that is that's really interesting yeah. to me. I love the idea of analyzing what is measurable. Yeah. Yeah. So does that does that is that telling you something about the direction you would take? Because I mean Schrodinger's, you know, I know that they use his equations, but I love how Heisenberg philosophically thought about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's it going back to the double slit experiment, which I think he's really referencing there. Yeah. Is that that's why he's saying don't try like don't say well but how can it be that way yeah it's not it's not that he's saying don't try to figure it out no he's just saying you you have to go with what's measurable yeah right they're they they get these things on the detector so then they have to build the equation based on that yeah yeah that's 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 yes that's right i was thinking about this he isn't saying don't try to figure this out yeah or understand it what he's saying is don't disagree that it could that it, that it that it could be that way. Yeah, like that's not the point because you're he's saying like don't you know don't say how can it be both of these things at the same time. This is what we've measured, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So he says today we have no paradoxes. Maybe <laughs> we have this infinity that comes in when we put all the laws together, but. The people sweeping under the sweeping the dirt under the rug are so clever that one sometimes thinks this is not a serious paradox. <laughs> Again, the fact that we have found all these particles does not tell us anything except that our knowledge is incomplete. I am sure that history does not repeat itself in physics, as you can tell from looking at the examples I have given. I thought this was interesting that he's saying, "All right, so let's go through the history. How did they do it?" But each time, each discovery is a complete of a completely different nature. And he's saying that he doesn't expect that to be able to repeat, that future discoveries will not follow the model of these previous ones. Hmm. In other words, that future discoveries of fundamental laws about the way things work, if there are any to come, which there, there must be, are going to be totally novel events. Hmm. But still, somebody might just guess an equation. Yeah, but the but but he's po I think he's trying to point out how that all comes about, and then you end up with this insight, and the way it's arrived at is totally different from ones from yeah. from before. Yeah. Uh, it's cool that the like the the building the collecting all these inconsistencies, right? Yeah. So they. So these are the holes in the theory. Like yeah. they keep discovering more holes or finding things that they didn't expect. Right. That they have no way to fit in. Right. And as those accumulate and everybody's worrying about them all the yeah. time, eventually somebody, they're all guessing like, well, what if we tried this? What if we tried this? And then somebody just nails it somehow. Yeah. It's well, cool. it's like it, he points out, we start with Newton, right? And he has... He has a bunch of different ideas that are sort of close to ex experimental results. Experimental results, in this case, being observations of bodies moving around in space, basically. Okay, and so then he's able to sort of build a mathematical model doing that. And then Maxwell, Maxwell's looking at magnetism and electricity, and he sees that there's something wrong with the math there, and he just adds some new stuff using a model that's totally wrong, but ends up getting the right answer anyway. Just to make the math consistent yeah. and, and thus combines electricity and magnetism into electromagnetic right. field, right? Then you have relativity, and he says that the, the discovery of relativity was there was an accumulation of paradoxes. Right. 
So it's a, a, a new and totally different situation right. from the previous two. And, and he had to take paradoxes. something that nobody was even thinking about and yeah. combine it together. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And then quantum mechanics is sort of similar because there's another accumulation of paradoxes yeah. from experiments. Right, but then the two the ways that it's approached, one guy comes up with some equations, the other guy's like, "Here's how, you, here's what you can actually measure and what you can't, yeah. and what are the consequences of doing those measurements." So then you end up with quantum mechanics. So now he's saying, "Today we have no paradoxes, maybe," and then he kind of points out that people are sweeping infinities under the rug, right? And they're really clever at doing it. So maybe you think there aren't any paradoxes, but could, there could be paradoxes in that. But he says, again, the fact that we found all these particles does not tell us anything except our knowledge is incomplete. So history does not repeat itself in physics. The reason is this. Any schemes which you can, th such as think of symmetry laws or put the information in mathematical form or guess equations, these are all known to everybody now. And they are all tried all the time. Mm. When you're stuck, the answer cannot be one of these because you have, will have tried these right away. So in other words, the way the way that Newton came up with stuff, the way okay. Einstein came up with stuff. Everybody's doing them all. Everybody's like trying those methods. Yeah. So it's got to be a new a one. A new one, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So he says, so there must be another way next time. Each time we get into the log jam of too much trouble, too many problems, it is because the methods that we are using are just like the ones we've used before. The next scheme or the new discovery is going to be made in a completely different way, so history does not help us much. Wow. I should like to say a little about Heisenberg's idea that you should not talk about what you cannot measure. <laughs> <laughs> we screw that up on this show. <laughs> <laughs> because many people talk about this idea without really understanding it. You can interpret this in the sense that the constructs or inventions that you make must be of such a kind that the consequences that you compute are comparable with experiment. That is, that you do not compute a consequence like a mu must be three goos when nobody knows what a mu or a goo is. Obviously, that is no good. But if the consequences can be compared with, to, with experiment, then that is all that is necessary. It does not matter that mu's and goos cannot appear in the guess. You can have as much junk in the guess as you like, provided that the consequences can be compared with experiment. This is not always fully appreciated. People often complain of the unwarranted extension of the ideas of particles and paths, etc., into the atomic realm. Not so at all. There is nothing unwarranted about the extension. We must, and we should, and we always do, extend as far as we can beyond what we already know, beyond those ideas we have already obtained. Dangerous? Yes. Uncertain? Yes. But it is the only way to make progress. Although it is uncertain, it is necessary to make science useful. Science is only useful if it tells you about some experiment that has not been done. It is no good if it only tells you what just went on. It is necessary to extend the ideas beyond where they have been tested. For example, in the law of gravitation, which was developed to understand the motion of planets, it would have been of no use if Newton had simply said, I now understand the planets and had not felt able to try to compare it with the Earth's pull on the moon, or for later men to say, maybe what holds the galaxies together is gravity. We must try that. You could say, when you get to the size of the galaxies, since you know nothing about it, anything can happen. I know this, but there is no science in accepting this type of limitation. There is no ultimate understanding of the galaxies. But on the other hand, if you assume that the entire behavior is due only to known laws, this assumption is very limited and definite and easily broken by experiment. <clears throat> what we are looking for is j just such hypotheses, very definite and easy to compare with experiment. The fact, is that, the fact is that the way the galaxies behave so far does not seem to be against the proposition. So I think Except what Except now it is, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, what he's trying to make clear there, though, is, is good. He's just saying, like, yeah, so you take this idea... And then you extend it out to stuff, and then you test it out, right? Right, And you want definite, clear, specific ideas because those are the ones you can check and say, nope, it's wrong, right? right? Or, well, it seems to compare, you know, positively with this, so let's test it against something else. Let's stick it over Push here. Push it further out, yeah. yeah. And I think that 
he doesn't mention any any dark matter stuff, but this is exactly how they came around with dark matter by right. taking the ideas of gravity, Newton's laws, relativity, whatever, sticking them out into galaxies, checking them against observations, and then finding something wrong. Right. You know, a this, big something wrong, a very large something wrong. Yeah. Okay, so he says I can give you another example, even more interesting and important. Probably the most powerful single assumption that contributes most to the prog progress of biology is the, is the assumption that everything animals do, the atoms can do, that the things that are seen in the biological world are the results of the behavior of physical and chemical phenomena with no extra something. You could always say, when you come to living things, anything can happen. If you accept that you will never understand living things... Or if you accept that, you will never understand living things. It is very hard to believe that the wiggling of the tentacle of the octopus is nothing but some fooling around of the atoms according to the known physical laws. But when it is investigated with this hypothesis, one is able to make guesses quite accurately about how it works. In this way, one, make great, one makes great progress in understanding. So far, the tentacle has not been cut off. It has not been found that this idea is wrong. So yeah, that's, that's him being mechanistic a bit, right? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I agree in 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 ways. You know, he's basically saying life is no different; that it obeys all these fundamental physical laws, and I right. would say that that's true. But they haven't all been discovered yet, right? It's the only thing. Yeah. So it is not unscientific to make a guess, although many people who are not in science think that it is. Some years ago, I had a conversation with a layman about flying saucers because I am scientific, so I'm supposed to know all about flying saucers. <laughs> I said, I don't think there are flying saucers. So my antagonist said, is it impossible that there are flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible? No, I said, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. At that, he said, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it's impossible, then how can you say that it's unlikely? <laughs> <laughs> but that is the way that it, that it is scientific. It is scientific only to say what is more likely and what is less likely and not to be proving all the time the possible and the impossible. To define what I mean, I might have said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the results of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence than of the unknown rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. It is just more likely, that is all. It is a good guess, and we always try to guess the most likely explanation keeping in the back of the mind the fact that if it does not work, we must discuss the other possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we guess what to keep and what to throw away? We have all these nice principles and known facts, but we are in some kind of trouble. Either we get the infinities or we do not get enough of a description. We are missing some parts. Sometimes that means that we have to throw away some idea, or at least in the past, it has always turned out that some deeply held idea has to be thrown away. The question is what to throw away and what to keep. If you throw it all away, that is going a little far, and then you have not much to work with. After all, the conservation of energy looks good, and it is nice, and I do not want to throw it away. To guess what to keep and what to throw away takes considerable skill. Actually, it is probably merely a matter of luck, but it looks as if it takes considerable skill. <laughs> <laughs> Probability amplitudes are very strange, and the first thing you think is that the strange new ideas are clearly cockeyed. Yet everything that can be deduced from the ideas of the existence of quantum mechanical probability amplitudes, strange though they are, they do work throughout the long list of strange particles 100%. Therefore, I do not believe that when we find out the inner guts of the composition of the world, we shall find these ideas are wrong. I do think this part is right, but I am only guessing, and I am telling you how I guess. On the other hand, I believe that the theory that space is continuous is wrong, because we get these infinities and other difficulties, and we are left with questions on what determines the size of all the particles. I rather suspect that the simple ideas of geometry extended down into infinitely small space are wrong. Here, of course, I am only making a hole, and I am not telling you what to substitute. If I did, I should finish this lecture with a new law. 
Some people have used the inconsistency of all the principles to say that there is only one possible consistent world, that if we put all the principles together and calculate very exactly, we shall not only be able to deduce the principles, but we shall also discover that these are the only principles that could possibly exist if the thing is still to remain consistent. That seems to me to be a big order. I believe that sounds like wagging the dog by the tail. I believe that it has to be given that certain things exist, not all the 50 odd particles, but a few little things like electrons, etc. And then with all the principles, the great complexities that come out are probably a definite consequence. I do not think that you can get the whole thing from arguments about consistencies. Another problem we have is the meaning of the partial symmetries. These symmetries, like the statement that neutrons and protons are nearly the same, but not the same for electricity, or the fact that the law of reflection symmetry is perfect except for one kind of reaction, these are very annoying. The thing is almost symmetrical, but not completely. So now two schools of, th of thought exist. One will say that it, it is really simple, that they are really symmetrical, but that there is a little complication which knocks it off. Then there is another school of thought, which has only one representative, myself, which says, no, the thing may be complicated and, may be, and become simple only through the complications. So this is interesting. This last bit here, it sounds like he's saying that he disagrees with every other physicist. Yeah. Yeah. On this. That they think that, that all of it's really symmetrical. And he's like, nope. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> There's no reason why it has to be symmetri symmetrical. Right, like the symmetry arises from the complicated uh, patterns that the thing can... Yes, yeah. He can says, yeah. Make. Th that's right. Yeah, he's saying that the, the symmetries aren't the fundamental fundamental thing, yeah. He says, the Greeks believed that the orbits of the planets were circles, but actually they are ellipses. They are not quite symmetrical, but they are very close to circles. The question is, why are they very close to circles. Why are they nearly symmetrical? Because of a long, complicated effect of tidal friction, which is a very complicated idea. It is possible that nature, in her heart, is completely unsymmetrical in these things, but in the complexities of reality, it gets to look approximately as if it is symmetrical, and the ellipses look almost like circles. That is another possibility, but nobody knows. It is just guesswork. That's really cool. Yeah. Man. Yeah, some of that stuff, uh, I just, I don't know. It's hard to follow. It's, it's... Yeah, some of it's a little tough to follow. But I think Is he's it... just, he's just trying to show you different ways of looking at it and how, how could we think about these things and come up with a new law. And he's like, mm -hmm. well, here's what some people think you know, or here's the situation and people have said this about it and this about it. And so far, none of these philosophies or talk of ways of thinking about it have arrived at anything new, but here are the ideas. Yeah. 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 All right. Cool stuff. Last break. Yep. Now you see, of course, that with this method, we can disprove any definite theory. You have a definite theory, a real guess, from which you can really compute consequences which could be compared to experiment, and in principle, we can get rid of any theory. You can always prove any definite theory wrong. Notice, however, we never prove it right. Suppose that you invent a good guess, calculate the consequences, and discover that every consequence that you calculate agrees with experiment. The theory is then right? No, it is simply not proved wrong. What's the percentage level? 99 point something. <laughs> oh, of being wrong? Yeah. I don't know. Almost always wrong, almost all the time is one way to say it. 99.8% <laughs> yeah, wrong. 99.8. It's the new audit just came in. <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, 99.8% wrong all the time. Science. That's it. <laughs> 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 the point two percent, we just we actually don't know what's going on with right, that. Right? Yeah, those haven't been checked. <laughs> <laughs> They're too vague to That's check. That's right. That's probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. So Feynman says, suppose you have two theories, A and B, which look completely different psychologically with different ideas in them and so on, but that all the consequences that are computed from each are exactly the same and both agree with experiment. These two theories, although they sound different at the beginning, have all consequences the same, which is usually easy to prove mathematically by showing that the logic from A and B will always give corresponding consequences. Suppose we have two such theories. How are we going to decide which one is right? There is no way by science because they both agree with experiment to the same extent. So two theories, although they may, be, may have deeply different ideas behind them, may be mathematically in identical and then there is no scientific way to distinguish them. However, for psychological reasons, in order to guess new theories, these two things may be very far from equivalent because one gives a man different ideas from the other. By putting the theory in a certain kind of framework, you get an idea of what to change. There will be something, for instance, in theory A that talks about something and you will say, well, I'll change that idea in here. But to find out what the corresponding thing is that you are going to change in B, may be very complicated. It may not be a simple idea at all. In other words, although they are identical before they are changed, there are certain ways of changing one which look natural, which will not look natural in the other. Therefore, psychologically, we must keep all the theories in our heads, and every theoretical physicist who is any good knows six or seven different theoretical representations for exactly the same physics. Wow. He knows that they are all equivalent, and that nobody is ever going to be able to decide which one is right at that level. But he keeps them in his head, hoping that they will give him different ideas for guessing. <laughs> That's cool. This is why you don't tell him 10, 20, 30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this reminds me of another point, he says, that the philosophy or ideas around a theory may change enormously when there are very tiny changes in the theory. For instance, Newton's ideas about space and time agreed with experiment very well. But in order to get the correct motion of the orbit of Mercury, which was a tiny, tiny difference, the difference in the character of the theory needed was enormous. The reason is that Newton law, Newton's laws were so simple and so perfect, and they produced definite results. In order to get something that would produce a slightly different result, it had to be completely different. In stating a new law, you cannot make imperfections on a perfect thing. You have to have another perfect thing. So the differences in philosophical ideas between Newton's and Einstein's theories of gravitation are enormous. So what are these philosophies? They are really tricky ways to compute consequences quickly. A philosophy, which is sometimes called an understanding of the law, is simply a way that a person holds the law in his mind in order to guess quickly at consequences. Some people have said, and it is true in cases like Maxwell's equations, never mind the philosophy, never mind anything of this kind, just guess the equations. The problem is only to compute the answers so that they agree with experiment, and it is not necessary to have a philosophy or an argument or words about the equation. That is good in the sense that if you guess the equation, you are not prejudicing yourself, and, if you, and you will guess better. But on the other hand, maybe the philosophy helps you to guess. It is very hard to say. For those people who insist that the only thing that is important is that the theory agrees with experiment, I would like to imagine a discussion between a Mayan astronomer and his student. The Mayans were able to calculate with great precision predictions, for example, for eclipses, and for the position of the moon in the sky, the position of Venus, etc. It was all done by arithmetic. They counted a certain number and subtracted some numbers and so on. There was no discussion of what the moon was. There was no discussion even of the idea that it went around. They just calculated the time when there would be an eclipse or when the moon would rise at the full and so on. Suppose that a young man went to the astronomer and said, I have an idea. Maybe those things are going around and there are balls of something like rocks out there and we could calculate how they move in a completely different way from just calculating what time they appear in the sky. Yes, says the astronomer, and how accurately can you predict eclipses? He says, I haven't developed the thing very far yet. So the astronomer says, well, we can calculate eclipses more accurately than you can with your model, so you must not pay any attention to your idea because obviously the mathematical scheme is better. 
So there is a very strong tendency when someone comes up with an idea and says, let's suppose that the world is this way for people to say to him, what would you get for the answer to such and such a problem? And he says, I haven't developed it far enough. <laughs> and they say, well, we have already developed it much further and we can get the answers very accurately. So it is a problem whether or not to worry about philosophies behind ideas. I love how he just brings the Mayans into it. <laughs> so he went on a trip. Yeah. With his, his, his wife was like all about pyramids. Yeah. She was just like, let's go to pyramids. Like, yeah. That's our deal, right? <laughs> yeah. And he was so he's like, I don't, I don't care about pyramids at all. Yeah. So he's sitting in the hotel room while she's out running up and down pyramids. Yep. I'm just like, dude, <laughs> what's wrong with you? <laughs> but he also got fascinated with the <clears throat> antikythera mechanism. Yes. But when he was... But in, then he got his hands on like what was it the Dresden Codex? He got his hands on one of the Mayan. That's what I was saying. Yeah. He was he was in in uh, wherever they were, and she was running up and down Mayan pyramids, and he yeah. had the pamphlet. Yeah, and it was it, it was showing how they. It was something like the Venus, right? It was calculations for Venus or whatever. It was showing something about the minds, and there was kind of like a thing. It was like it showed you what they did, and then yeah. on the back was like a, a translation of it. Yeah, that's right. And he was yeah, like, yeah. I'm not going to look at the translation. Yeah. I'm going to see if I can figure out what they were doing just by looking at these things <laughs> that they right. have, yeah. these Mayan d depictions or whatever. Yeah, the glyphs, yeah. And so he works it all out, and he figures it out. He's like, okay, that one's Mars or whatever. This one's this. And yeah. And then when he flips over the pamphlet, it says – it basically – the translation or the the analysis was completely bull. It was just bullshit. Yeah. Like they didn't realize, I guess, whoever had written the pamphlet, that these were actual. They were about astronomical calculations. Astronomical yeah. calculations. Yeah, yeah. They, they couched it in like mythical Mythi terms. Yes, yeah. exactly. And he yeah. was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is very accurate. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. But this is interesting the way he says this. He's, you know, he's making some assumptions here about what the Mayans may have thought. Yeah. Well, he's using it as an example of, like, yeah. why you shouldn't... Why, why it's difficult to say which one is more important, yeah. Well, why a philosophy can be good, because the guy comes up to the Mayans and is like, yeah, what if they were, like, little balls out there and they were going around and... Yeah, but the Mayan astronomers are like, we get very accurate yeah. calculations on what's going to happen. So we with, don't need With your... pure math, we don't yeah. need your theories about weird balls out in space. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's a great point. Yes. But there could have been a scenario where the his theory was just completely wrong, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, they're, hol they're holes in a... Uh... Yeah. yeah, in a veil. <laughs> yeah. You just don't know. So you yeah. got to... You, gotta, you have to work on it very hard. Right. And what I kept thinking when I was reading this is that the person with the new idea was coming to the other th people with the old idea too soon. That's what I kept thinking. <laughs> you know, if they're doing their calculations and they're very precise, don't show up and tell them you have a new idea until you can answer their question about right. precision. Yeah. But he needed help with the calculations. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and they just shut him down. Yeah. Because he on both in both of these examples, he's that's exactly the, the purpose. What to say, the person is saying, "Well, I haven't developed it that far yet." That's exactly what happened to me when I talked to that mathematician about. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I tell, I was like, "Dude, so I have this idea," and I tell him all this stuff, and then he's like, "Well, the math that we have works great, and we don't yeah. have any problems with <laughs> exactly. it." No, I, like, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I know that." <laughs> yeah, I want to know if it also works with this idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Feynman says another way of working, of course, is to guess new principles. In Einstein's theory of gravitation, he guessed on top of all the other principles, the principle that corresponded to the idea that the forces are always proportional to the masses. He guessed the principle that if you are in an accelerating car, you cannot distinguish that from being in a gravitational field. And by adding that principle to all the other principles, he was able to deduce the correct laws of gravitation. That outlines a number of possible ways of guessing. I would now like to come to some other points about the final result. First of all, when we are all finished and we have a mathematical theory by which we can compute consequences, what can we do? It really is an amazing thing. 
In order to figure out what an atom is, uh, in, order to fi in order to figure out what an atom is going to do in a given situation, we make up rules with marks on paper, carry them into a machine which has switches that open and close in some complicated way, and the result will tell us what the atom is going to do. If the way that these switches open and close were some kind of model of the atom, if we thought that the atom had switches in it, then I would say that I understood more or less what is going on. I find it quite amazing that it is possible to predict what will happen by mathematics, which is simply following rules which really have nothing to do with what is going on in the original thing. The closing and opening of switches in a computer is quite different from what is happening in nature. One of the most important things in this guess compute consequences compare with experiment business is to know when you are right. It is possible to know when you are right way ahead of checking all the consequences. You can recognize truth by its beauty and simplicity. It is always easy when you have made a guess and done two or three little calculations to make sure that it is not obviously wrong to know that it is right. When you get it right, it is obvious that it is right, at least if you have any experience, because usually what happens is that more comes out than goes in. Your guess is, in fact, that something is very simple. If you cannot see immediately that it is wrong and it is simpler than it was before, then it is right. <laughs> the inexperienced and crackpots and people like that make guesses that are simple, but you can immediately see that they are wrong, so that doesn't count. Others, the inexperienced students, make guesses that are very complicated, and it sort of looks like, as if it's right, but I know it is not true because the truth always turns out to be simpler than you thought. What we need is imagination, but imagination in a terrible straitjacket. We have to find a new view of the world that has to agree with everything that is known, but disagree in its pre predictions somewhere, otherwise it is not interesting. And in that disagreement, it must agree with nature. If you can find any other view of the world which agrees over the entire range where things have already been observed, but disagrees somewhere else, you have made a great discovery. This is very nearly impossible, but not quite, to find any theory which agrees with experiments over the entire range in which all theories have been checked and yet gives different consequences in some other range, even a theory whose different consequences do not turn out to agree with nature. A new idea is extremely difficult to think of. It takes a fantastic imagination. I love that part. Yeah. So when he's talking about how you know that you're right, he's still like, this is the weird thing about it. He's, he's not saying like, I guess the caveat would be, with the general uncertainty that you're, you might be proven wrong by broader. Yes. Yeah. That's what I thought too. He just spent stuff. all this time saying that we're never, we never know if we're right. And then he's like, this is how you know you're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he's kind of, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Yeah. He's, he's basically saying like you come up with an idea and you fix something and it's a little bit more simple and you do a few calculations and it, it matches experiment and you're like, okay, this is, you yeah. know, I just cleaned it up a little bit. Right. Yep. And then, and then this stuff where he's basically saying to come up with a new idea that still works with all of these observations, but then yet makes other predictions that are completely different from current existing ideas. Yes. This is a very difficult thing to do. Even if those predictions don't match with nature. Yeah. It's already hard even when it's wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to come up with a wrong idea that does all that. Yeah. Yeah. Much less a correct one. So he says, what of the future of this adventure? What will happen ultimately? We are going along, guessing the laws. How many laws are we going to have to guess? I do not know. Some of my colleagues say that this fundamental aspect of our science will go on, but I think there will certainly not be perpetual novelty, say for a thousand years. This thing cannot keep going on so that we are always going to discover more and more new laws. If we do, it will become boring and that there are so many levels underneath, one, uh, underneath the other. It seems to me that what can happen in the future is either that all the laws become known, that is, if you had enough laws, you could compute consequences and they would always agree with experiment, which would be the end of the line. Or it may happen that if the experiments get harder and harder to make, more and more expensive, so you get 99.9% .9 of the phenomena, but there is always some phenomenon which has just been discovered, which is very hard to measure, and which disagrees 
And as soon as you have the explanation of that one, there's always another one, and it gets slower and slower and more and more uninteresting. That is the way it may end, but I think it has to end in one way or another. We are very lucky to live in an age in which we are still making discoveries. It is like the discovery of America. You only discover it once. The age in which we live is the age in which we are discovering the fundamental laws of nature, and that day will never come again. It is very exciting. It is marvelous. But this excitement will have to go. Of course, in the future, there will be other interests. There will be the interest of the connection of one level of phenomena to another, the phenomena in biology and so on, or, if you are talking about exploration, exploring other planets. But there will not, be, not still be the same things that we are doing now. Another thing that will happen is that, ultimately, if it turns out that all is known or it gets very dull, the vigorous philosophy and the careful attention to all these things that I have been talking about will gradually disappear. The philosophers who are always on the outside making stupid remarks... <laughs> <laughs> ...will be able to close in because we cannot push them away by saying, if you were right, we would be able to guess all the rest of the laws because when the laws are all there, they will have an explanation for them. For instance, there are always explanations about why the world is three-dimensional. Well, there is only one world, and it is hard to tell if that explanation is right or not. So that if everything were known, there would be some explanation about why those were the right laws. But that explanation would be in a frame that we cannot criticize by arguing that that type of reasoning will not permit us to go further. There will be a degeneration of ideas, just like the degeneration that great explorers feel is occurring when tourists begin moving in on a territory. So he's like comparing the philosophers to tourists. <laughs> <laughs> the physicists are the explorers and the philosophers are the tourists as soon as they show up the place is basically ruined and you need to move on <laughs> in this age people are experiencing a delight the tremendous delight that you get when you guess how nature will work in a new situation never seen before from experiments and information in a certain range you can guess what is going to happen in a region where no one has ever explored before it is a little different from regular exploration in that there are enough clues on the land discovered to guess what the land that has not been discovered is going to look like. These guesses, incidentally, are often very different from what you have already seen. They take a lot of thought. What is it about nature that lets this happen? That it is possible to guess from one part what the rest is going to do? That is an unscientific question. I do not know how to answer it, and therefore I am going to give an unscientific answer. I think it is because nature has a simplicity, and therefore, a great beauty. I love that, too. Yeah. there It, it is... Again, this is one of those things to me that's like... Something I would have never thought of, but seems... It, it seems obvious that this is the way it would be, but then when you really think about it, why should it be that way? That you can look at one part of nature... And it gives you clues as to how other aspects of it work. Yeah. That in and of itself suggests that there is some fundamental yeah. simplicity, right? That, that governs everything. That's why it's all connected. Yeah. What did he say in one of the earlier chapters that nature only uses the longest threads? Yes. To weave her pattern. Right. Yeah. So you can look at one little piece and you know that that thread goes throughout the entire tapestry, basically. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the, that is the end of the final lecture there. Um, I do have some marked from the forward, which is supposed to update some of this. I don't think we have time to read we all got, of them. We got uh, seven minutes or so. Yeah. But I can read some of it. So this is a forward written by, uh, I don't know how to say that guy's name, Frank. Frank. It's written by Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so he says a lot of ha has happened in physics since 1965 and by the way this was this forward was written in 2004 so probably a lot has happened since this forward was written yeah, yeah. a lot has happened in physics since 1965 while the character of physical law holds up amazingly well it can use some updates so i'll offer a few before beginning let me emphasize that the need for these particular updates enhances rather than detracts from the book Feynman tried to identify issues at the forefront of physics that seemed unresolved, that were important and approachable. As you'll see, 
he did succeed in doing just that. On page 116, Feynman wrote, quote, Therefore, I think it is necessary to add to the physical laws the hypothesis that in the past, the universe was more ordered in the technical sense than it is today. I think this is the additional statement that is needed to make sense and to make an understanding of the irreversibility, unquote. So this is about the irreversibility of phenomena. In recent years, physical cosmology has matured into a rich and sophisticated science with many impressive and quantitative results. The broad outlines of Big Bang cosmology are no longer in doubt. And so, armed with considerable insight, we can assess Feynman's hypothesis that in the past, the universe was more ordered. According to modern physical cosmology, our universe evolved from a very special, remarkably simple beginning. During the initial stages of the, of the Big Bang, the matter in the universe was in thermal equilibrium at an extremely high temperature, almost perfectly uniform in composition and density. Since then, the universe has expanded and cooled. The structures we see today, ranging from clusters of galaxies to individual galaxies to stars and planets, emerged through gravitational instability from extremely small deviations from perfect uniformity. More specifically, regions containing slightly more than the average density of matter attracted surrounding matter more effectively than less dense regions, thus getting denser in a self-reinforcing cycle until they condensed into the structures we see today. Now, a nearly uniform, hot distribution of matter is, on the face of it, the opposite of ordered. Superficially, then, it might appear that Feynman's explanation of irreversibility is a non-starter. But deeper consideration, however, validates his guess. The point is that while matter was in a maximally disordered state, approximating thermal equilibrium close to the Big Bang, gravity was in a highly unusual state, very far from its equilibrium. Because gravity would like to clump things together, a state of near uniformity is very far from gravitational equilibrium. As just noted, gravitational instability makes small deviations from uniformity grow. Thus, the gravitational form of order implicit in Big, ba Big Bang cosmology is not just a theoretical quibble, but the deep origin of structure in our universe. So once we admit that refinement, we can elevate what Feynman called a hypothesis about the origin of irreversibility into accomplished fact. There was a lot of gravitational order in the early universe and its gradual partial de degradation, that is, the formation of galaxies, stars, and planets, is almost certain certainly the deep origin of irreversibility as Feynman proposed. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> so while Feynman's intuitive arguments are not scrupulously rigorous, I find them convincing. And of course, all of this still leaves open the question of why the universe began in a state with matter ordered but gravity disordered. But Feynman's discussion of the origin of irreversibility frames the central question brilliantly and takes a big step towards an answer. On page 152, Feynman writes... We do not today understand the forces between neutrons and protons to the extent that if you wanted me to and gave me enough time in computers, I could calculate the energy levels of carbons or something like that. But now we do. We have a very precise and accurately tested theory of the strong force called quantum chromodynamics, or QCD for short. QCD makes much more general the quantum electrodynamics, or QED, which won Feynman his Nobel Prize. I like to call QCD QED on steroids. QED, or quantum electrodynamics, tells the story of a single photon responding to an electric charge. But quantum, quantum chromodynamics is the saga of an octet of gluons, which can respond to or transform three different kinds of charge, which are called, rather incongruously, color charges. According to QCD, Protons and neutrons, and the many other strongly interacting particles discovered at high-energy accelerators, which Feynman called the dredge digging up all this mud, are made from quarks and gluons. Quarks and gluons are ideally simple particles that obey beautiful equations, while protons and neutrons and the other strongly interacting particles are complicated composites. People with powerful computers have used the equations of QCD to calculate the masses of the most important strongly interacting particles, including protons and neutrons, and now they are making a good start on nuclear physics. So that's a good update. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. On page 155, Feynman writes, 
it seems that if we take quantum mechanics plus relativity plus the proposition that everything has to be local plus a number of tacit assumptions, we get inconsistency because we get infinity for various things when we calculate them. And if we get infinity, how can we ever say that this agrees with nature? Here, Feynman, for once, went astray. Indeed, the theory that we just discussed, quantum chromodynamics, incorporates relativity, quantum mechanics, and locality in a fully consistent way and also describes how nature works. We now understand that the infinities which plague many quantum field theories arise because the couplings between particles become very strong at short distances, ultimately leading to singularities. Which would be infinity. infinities. That's yeah. where the infinities yeah. are coming from. But in other theories, including quantum chromodynamics, the interaction between particles can become weaker, not stronger, at short distances. This is a property called asymptotic freedom. Asymptotically free theories do not contain the nasty infinities that so disturbed Feynman. Now I'll add a couple of brief comments that are not updates as such, but seem appropriate. On page 160, Feynman writes, For example, the quantum theory of gravitation is going very slowly, if at all, because all the experiments you can do never involve quantum mechanics and gravitation at the same time. So one might quibble with the way this statement is formulated. After all, astrophysics is full of situations where both gravitation and quantum mechanics are relevant, and here on Earth all quantum experiments take place within Earth's gravitational field. What Feynman meant to say, of course, is that experiments to probe characteristically quantum effects of gravitational interactions, roughly speaking the influence of in individual gravitons, are impractical, and that is still the case, as Feynman anticipated this problem has made progress in the quantum theory of gravitation difficult and uncertain. <laughs> so that's a bunch of waffling to say he's still he's right. right. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was not being ridiculously precise with the statement, but he was talking to the layman. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so there's a bunch more here, but I think we can probably end it at that. What was the part where he said you read it to me before the show? Did you get, read that already about how he was like, yeah, we've fully established this? Yeah, yeah, that was that the was part the about the thing. Big Bang. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, it's totally correct, right? What did he say? Uh, during the, um, he said, the broad outlines of Big Bang, Big Bang cosmology are no longer in doubt. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it's, like, I think, again, this is the problem I have with the language that sometimes these, these people use. Feynman spent the entire final chapter saying, that you should always think of it as being something that isn't true, right? In other words, that like that that the next idea can disprove it or change it completely. Right. So when they say something like, well, this is no longer in doubt, what does that mean? That no one is thinking it could possibly turn out to be wrong at some point in the future? And if that's the case, are they really doing science? Yeah, I know. That's that's what I mean. I, I it's it's like all through this book, Feynman is telling you how you have to think about science correctly. And this guy, in his forward, is not doing it the same way. That's what right. I mean. You see phrases like that, like, well, this is no longer in doubt, or we've got this basically figured out. Yeah. You know. So I don't know. I Maybe he's right. Maybe no one should doubt the, the broad outlines of Big Bang cosmology. I have no idea. <laughs> but it seems to me like that's just, that that's like the Mayan astronomer. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder what Feynman would have thought of About this forward. forward. <laughs> <laughs> you can't put that in there. <laughs> we just haven't waited long enough to find out you were wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I love him. That's, he's. I just like I love the way he looks at the. At at the universe and at science. Yep. Yeah, this this forward goes on to sort of give um, Feynman's background and some stuff about the history. Oh, of oh my! The watcher says his last name is pronounced Wilcheck. Oh yeah, <laughs> Frank Wilcheck. It's an afternoon. It is an afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, there's more good stuff in here about the history of discovery on quantum electrodynamics. Um, 
But I think that those were the updates that he wanted to give. Yeah. So again, cool, I recommend everybody to read this this book. It's great, and the the diagrams do help. Or watch the you know, watch the le- watch the lectures themselves. Maybe do both. Very entertaining to yeah. me. All right, man. Yeah. I think book done. Book done. Cool. What to, are we gonna I need do? To throw it down. What are we gonna do book next done. time? <laughs> That's right. What? What? The, what the next book report is? No. What's the next? What are we doing next week? Oh, um, well, we may have a guest next week. Okay. We'll see. All right. Yeah. And we have a bunch of emails to catch up on, so we'll have to do another <laughs> communications. communications episode. And then, you know, I've got a, I got a stack of books. We eventually have to try to do Hamlet's Mill, yeah. which is going to be really hard. Yeah. We slowly grind away at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also got some books from George Howard. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. Got plenty to do then. Yeah. So is this the last show of the month? Or is there one more for the end of the month? I think this might be the last one of the month. Really? Yeah. In which case, I need to list off our... Well, Sunday's the 31st. So that would be next week. Yeah. Right? Our next show is going to be published in August, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, we have some Patreon uh, producers then. Executive producers, Philip Baklamov, Matt Shy, Peter Shell, and Frank M. Thank you guys so much for supporting us at the Ascended Snake Force Master Level on the Patreon. Ascended Snake Force Master. Yes. And we have... Uh, the associate executive producer, Daniel Gandhi, supporting us at Master Snake Force Captain Level on the Patreon. Thank you, Daniel. Really appreciate everybody who supports us on the Patreon. And of course, if you want to be a producer of any of the episodes, you can send in a PayPal or join the Patreon. And if you do join the Patreon, you will get special content. There is, we do occasionally upload extra episodes and bumper music and random videos and other stuff. What are you doing? I'm trying to log into the PayPal. <laughs> Kyle's, <laughs> Kyle's going through robot checks right now. <laughs> it's just, I have a new phone, so it's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> So you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. It has all the podcast-related stuff there, uh, including ways to join the pyramid scheme, pyramid scheme being support for the show. Uh, there are links there for the Patreon and a donate button for PayPal. Uh, you can also join the Discord. There's links for that on the website as well. Yep. Really appreciate all the yeah. support, you guys. We do. So, uh, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed that character of physical law. It was a lot longer of a book report than we thought it was going to be, but it was still great. It's kind of how they, that's kind of how they go. Yeah. We, they I, I need to, um, I need to multiply my book report <laughs> estimates, estimates by, by four. By four. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. During all that time, the theory had been failed to be proved wrong and could be taken to be temporarily right, but it can never be proved right because tomorrow's experiment may succeed in proving what you thought was right wrong. So we never are right, we can only be sure we're wrong. Incidentally, some people, one of the ways of stopping the science would be to only do experiments in the region where you know the laws. But, uh, the experimenters search most diligently and with the greatest effort in exactly those places where it seems most likely that we can prove the theory is wrong. In other words, we're trying to prove ourselves wrong as quickly as possible, because only in that way do we find progress.